Well, thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I didn't realize I was the last speaker, the grand finale, so to speak. So it's a real honor to be a part of it. And it is an interesting title because you may or may not know that organic agriculture and organic farming and, and organic food in general is kind of uh, controversial in a sense that uh, there, there are people, um, mainly those people reside in conventional ag industry and are uh, scientists that su support the conventional ag industry who are opposed to organic agriculture, think it's just a uh, hippie, hippie farming, uh, a fad that will pass that we can't possibly feed the world with something as corny as organic agriculture and they have an image of it as returning back to the 1920s and um, grueling labor, of course, and no technology and Luddites and Amish and everything else they can throw at it. Well, um, those are the things that I want to try to uh, address today because those criticisms um, have been ongoing through the years and proponents of uh, organic agriculture just keep doing it and, and are getting better and better at it and people keep buying it. It's, in, it's continually increasing. It increases at a rate of around 20% annually, the sales of organic food. And so the population of consumers out there in the Western world, I should say, so, um, increasingly support organic agriculture. Why would that be? Why would people be willing to pay more for their food unless they really believe somehow that they're getting something more for it? I think the more people learn about our food system, where it comes from and what it's doing to us, the more people are saying maybe maybe we should be looking at uh, a different alternative and that's why uh, organic seems to be the uh, one of those alternatives. Um, I thought I'd start with just a brief history though of organic. It's It started really back in the 1960s with the hippie movement but um, where people kind of back to the land movement wanted to grow food more naturally and it was done mainly on a local basis. There weren't major large farms uh, growing organically at that time, but it was it, it, it started to expand. Hey, I've got a pointer. I'm going to use it too. Expansion of, of the market um, required that uh, there be some kind of verification system. Now you can imagine uh, farmers were were getting better at organic growing enough that they could ship across the country, across the state. They were calling it organic. There really wasn't any kind of certification system at that time. So people started discovering that um, organic grown in California wasn't necessarily the same thing as organic grown in Texas, or organic grown in Mexico. It was just a word and the, uh, the farmer who was producing got to call it that whether it abided by any kind of um, production practices or not. Typically it meant no chemical fertilizers. And still it, it means that, but we have a, a system by which we can verify it. So in the 70s and 80s there was a creation of what was called third party certification system. These were uh, independent certifiers who created rules on their own and, and then uh, got farmers to sign up under them. So they were signed up under uh, organic Crop Improvement Association's rules of organic and certified under those rules. So you knew that if you bought organic food from a farmer who was certified by OCIA, you could go back and look at OCIA's rules and, and figure out what that actually meant. But of course, in the late 80s, more and more farmers growing, more and more certifiers certifying, and many times the rules were not the same. Some certifiers were more lax than others. And so again, it was the same kind of problem, but on a different scale. Organic for one certifier didn't mean, necessarily mean the same thing as organic for a different certifier. So something very strange happened. All the people involved, well, I don't know if all of them were, but many of the people involved in the organic movement went to the federal government and said, help us make one rule that we will all follow. Help us make one rule that we'll all follow. 
So they did that in 1990 under the um, uh, farm bill that year. They created something called the Organic Foods Production Act that mandated the creation of the NOP. NOP stands for National Organic Program and a uniform uh, set of standards for organic production. Uh, I'm going to stop here and, and just mention if I if I use any kind of terms that that you don't know, that you don't recognize, please stop me, put your hand up, and and ask me what it is, um, and I'll be glad to to fill you in. Um, it took 10 years for uh, the NOSP, the uh, National Organic Standards Board, to write the rules that were finally released April 21st and implemented, and then um, a complete compliance of those rules for anybody wanting to produce organically and be certified. Uh, that happened on October. That was kind of the deadline. You had to, you had to be certified by then if you wanted to call yourself organic. So over the course of time, went from a completely independent system of organic growers and certifiers to now the, uh, the term organic means has a, is a legal term as defined by the uh, USDA and the National Organic Program. Oh, look at this. I had color-coded each one of those. All right. So um, that farm bill that... Uh, created the NOP, the National Organic Program, and the NOSB, and the standards. Um, the purpose of that was to establish national standards governing the marketing of certain organic products as organic, uh, assure consumers, see this was, this was part of it, is they wanted to assure consumers that organically produced products met a consistent standard. That's what that uh, national program did. And then of course to facilitate the interstate travel interstate commerce with, with that food. So that organic meant the same wherever, wherever organic food was sold. Um, I'd like to say, uh, make sure that you understand what organic is not. When someone says organic, organic does not mean that the food is completely chemical free. And what I mean by that is that the rules, the organic standard rules, do allow some use of certain chemicals. It's a very complicated list because it has um, manufactured products that are allowable. Things like bleach um, are allowable, for, especially for processors to wash their equipment. Even though it's a chemical, they allow the use of that chemical. They believe it's safe when used properly. So that's allowable by the rules. There are also natural substances that are not allowable in production. Things like arsenic, if you want to use that to try to control pests and stuff, even though that's a natural compound, is not allowable in organic systems. And so to say that it's completely chemical free, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, it also does not guarantee that the food you buy, if it's organic, that it's chemical free of chemicals. In fact, there's been research done testing uh, pesticide residue on food, organic food versus conventional food. Now, it is many, many, many times lower, that residue, on organic food. Where does that come from? It may drift in from a neighboring farm. I mean, many of these chemicals are now just ubiquitous in our, in our environment worldwide, right? So uh, it's not, it does not, and the certification does not guarantee that that food is chemical free when you buy it. The food is not tested. It is not uh, in a lab to make sure that it's chemi chemically free. It just guarantees or at least certifies that um, a farmer used a particular set of practices and did not use uh, a particular set of chemical inputs for the production of his food. It is not necessarily a guarantee of healthier food either. Although I believe it is, for the most part, it is not a guarantee that it is. Many people think it is, but this, the certification itself does not guarantee that. It also, organic does not mean a return to the 1800s for farmers. It is, this is not, um, although organic farming is much more labor intensive, uh, there are technologies that, besides the chemical, chemicals that are prohibited, that farmers have access to to make uh, their life and their work much easier. And um, 
There is more and more research now that is that are that is helping organic farmers do a much better job and uh, produce on a larger scale. And um, so it's not a return to the old type of farming, pioneer days, where you're behind a horse and stuff. What it is, though, what organic is, is now defined by the USDA. And this is the, um, this is the definition. Um, it's, an ecologically, it's an ecological production management system. Promotes and enhances biodiversity, biological cycles, and soil biological activity. Um, if you complete, if you read this whole statement, I emphasized in red the, the, these words that have to do with the ecological orientation of organic farming. It is much more than just uh, farming without the chemicals that are so common today. It is really an approach, an ecological approach to farming. Um, and I'll share more about what it, what it actually look, looks like. But I, I highlighted all these words to show just, just how strongly this is. This, this was written not by bureaucrats in, in the USDA. They actually put together the NOSB, the National Organic Standards Boards, which was made up of uh, very established and experienced organic farmers, um, in, in organic inspectors who had been inspectors for years up to that time before the rules and certifiers, people who were in the industry and experienced in the industry. And they really went to great pains to write something that was meaningful. They wanted it to be meaningful. They wanted it to, to be um, a different kind of agriculture. And so that's why the this, this captures the spirit of organic, not just the letter of the law. So that's, I wanted to make, make that clear. So what does this mean for, for farmers? How does organic farming look different than uh, conventional farming? Well, when it comes to seed, conventional growers um, primar primarily use treated seed. That's prohibited by organic. They use many times now GMOs, which are genetically modified organisms, seeds that have been genetically modified in a way that is not uh, natural breeding methodology. That is prohibited by organic. Uh, seeds for organic farmers have to come from an organic source, or at least they have to make a very strong attempt to find organically grown seeds to plant for their organically grown crop. If they can't find the seed, if they look and look and can't find the seed that they need, they can use conventionally raised seed, but it cannot be treated. No GMOs. GMOs are, not pro are, are prohibited completely. There was a big battle over that in the early days, but the organic folks won, won that one. Fertility. Fertility, of course, for traditional or conventional ag is chemically based, very high energy uh, input because it takes a tremendous amount of energy to um, manufacture uh, fertilizers. And um, it's hazardous. It's also a polluting. It's also a, a water pollution issue. For the organic grower, he's limited to using manures, compost, uh, what are called green manures, which is a uh, which is a cover crop that's grown not to be harvested, but just to be turned back into the soil to provide nutrients for the following crop. And there are certain approved products. There's more and more products out there. Um, byproducts from fish processing plants. They take the fish guts and heads and grind them up and kind of compost them and make a concentrated um, fertilizer out of them that you that can be used and is acceptable. There are many other types of products like that. They're they're typically uh, expensive. Uh, so mostly organic farmers use manure compost and green manures cover crops for that. Pest management similar thing. Conventional ag uses chemically based high energy input has potentially hazardous uh, materials. Organic farmers are limited to using things like rotations, rotating their crops um, many more years than just a continuous corn or corn soybean type system. Um, they try to diversify their ecosystems with different kinds of plantings and also they can use approved products as well. Um, rain, of course, irrigation, downstream impacts, pretty much the same. There's nothing there except for uh, farmers that irrigate conventionally, they can put 
fertilizer through the irrigation system. Uh, of course, organic farmers are not able to do that unless it's an approved product. Um, labor, conventional ag attempts to minimize labor through the use of these technologies and, and uh, ever increasingly larger equipment. Um, organic agriculture, as I said earlier, has a much higher labor intensive system. Um, because instead of spraying weeds, many times they have to go out and, and weed by hand, especially if they're a smaller scale system, or hire somebody to do that. Um, equipment, big and big, bigger is better for the conventional growers if he has lots of land. Um, organic growers are, can use any equipment they want, of course, and do. Many times it's very specialized and it's smaller scale because as a rule, organic growers are typically smaller scale than conventional growers. Because of the limitations, they just can't handle as much ground as a farmer farming conventionally. And that's the issue there. Um, I think there are basic principles that kind of guide organic production. One of them is biodiversity, which is also an ecological term. Uh, farmers, if they're doing this right, will attempt to uh, increase the biodiversity on their land. Where the conventional farmer will, will try to limit the biodiversity, he wants all of his resources to go into growing one crop. And then he harvests just a portion of that crop and he tries to maximize that portion. The organic grower is much more diverse because he sees value in having not only um, keeping around some of the species that might be a pest, but also the enemies of those pests, the, uh, the species that will uh, help him keep those pests in control. And so one of the principles is to have lots of biodiversity, to keep a lot of everything around so it keeps everything in balance. Okay. Sustainability, of course, um, that includes uh, or is mainly uh, what I'm talking about here is soil conservation structures, uh, conservation type tillage, drainage, rotations, again, mulching and integrating systems of animals and crops, not just, not just solely monoculture. Plant nutrition, uh, we've talked about this already, limited to composting. And uh, again, crop rotations. Crop rotation is a very important concept for organic growers because it breaks the life cycle of pests and weeds when you change one crop and don't put that crop again, in again for several years. So it's used uh, many different ways. Cover crops, as I said, is just a crop that is grown not to be harvested but to be turn, just turned, either turned under or just killed and left in place. That does several things. It returns nutrients from that crop to the, back to the soil, but many times they use it as a mulch type crop, which smothers out weeds. So if they can kill that crop or if it dies naturally, maybe frost killed, then it, 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 and they plant right into that, it creates a mat of uh, biomass that will keep weeds down and help with weed control. So there's lots of different uses for, for cover crops. Uh, same kind of story for, for pest management. Uh, crop rotations does the same thing, companion plantings, natural predators, actually purchasing um, biological, uh, what they call biologicals that are natural enemies of pest. pest. Uh, sometimes they buy um, insects that uh, will inflict damage on particular weeds or invasive species of weeds and other insects. Um, but it's all about uh, managing the ecosystem. And then, of course, the other principle, the last principle is um, integrity, keeping, maintaining organic integrity. And to do that, they, do, they keep good records so they can verify that they've done what they've said they've done. And if anybody questions them, they can uh, verify that they are organic. And also buffers. Buffers are the actual physical barrier between an organic farmer and the non-organic farmer. So there are buffer red, uh, requirements for organic growers to maintain so that uh, to um, limit the possibility of, of uh, being, um, you know, contaminated. That's the, that's the word I'm looking for. So as I started out and said, proponents of organic claim that the food is healthier 
claim that it's safer for the environment, claim that it's more profitable for farmers, which as a rule it generally is. Critics, of course, argue that it, that is, uh, there is no superior nutritive value in organic food. And the thing they always say is there's no research to back that up. Um, and they're right till just recently. They were right about that. Some people, some critics have even said that organic farming is worse for the environment. And um, the main proponent of this argument is a man named Dennis Avery of the Hudson Institute, who's gone around. He's been on this campus. He was famous for writing a book called Saving the World with Plastics and Pesticides. And he, um, his argument was that um, it's, he, he didn't even call it organic. He called it low-yielding agriculture. Low-yielding farm, farming, we can't grow enough food, and so we'd have to expand the acreage that we do farm and plow up acres of, of rainforest and everything. We'd have to farm every square inch of earth to grow enough food organically for all the people in the world. Therefore, that kind of farming on that kind of scale would destroy, destroy the environment uh, of those pristine, like uh, rainforests and whatnot. So that was his, uh, and also the uh, manure argument that putting manure on is dangerous and uh, shouldn't eat food that's been grown with uh, animal manure, uh, which there are obvious risks, but uh, I'll be uh, happy to address address those if uh, you want me to. And that it's not productive enough to feed the world. Well, these are the things I want to um, address. Uh, because now there is uh, research that kind of finally has started to come out to address these things. And so I'm going to really answer. And now I'm finally done with my introduction. And I'm going to get on to the main <laughs> point of my talk, which is to answer these three questions. Is organically produced food really healthier? Is it uh, are organic food systems productive enough? And um, is it really in more environmentally friendly? Because um, there are some issues around 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 these things. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is is health. I've given the um, reference here, and also I uh, need to mention I put together some notes. Everything from here down, I have notes on these references that I'm using and um, quotes from, from the papers. If anybody wants to read more on that and look, look them up, I, I brought a few copies of those. But this paper came out. I, I was able to hear this woman speak, A. A. Mitchell, Allison Mitchell, um, earlier this year out in California. She's completed a, a research project that, that compares organically grown food and conventionally grown food looked at the nutrient, nutrient values, looked at the flavonoids, what's called the flavonoids in the food. These are uh, secondary plant metabolites. Um, they're essentially vitamins for us, okay? Um, the thing is, she's not the first. There's been lots of research comparing organic and conventional food. And what they typically do is go to the grocery store and they pull cans off the shelves and test the food and... Typically, the results have been no difference, no difference in nutrient value. Well, what, they, what those research projects ignored is how uh, variable uh, the systems are and how that, that those foods came from and how big of a difference that can make. Nutrient value can vary just based on what kind of soil the food was grown on, whether it's organic or conventional, whether the rains came at the right time, that year, what, what had to be done, what was used for fertilizer. I mean, there's a million different variables in farming. And the, the research projects that compared nutritive value in organic versus conventional food in the past never took any of those into account. Um, Allison Mitchell is working uh, with data from a 10-year comparison study out in Davis. Um, well, they took 10 years of data. This is a long-term farming comparison study out in California. The, the, the crops were grown on the same land, treated essentially the same, uh, grown under the same conditions, except one was grown organically and one was grown uh, conventionally. So they tried to, they made a very strong attempt to account for all those variables. All right? So this is the best of attempt yet. And what she looked at were the flavonoids in tomatoes grown under these two conditions. 
Um, flavonoids um, do, are, great, are great for humans. Uh, they protect against cardiovascular disease. Uh, to a lesser extent, they protect against cancer and age-related diseases like dementia. Uh, they, are they act as antioxidants for us. Okay. Another thing about flavonoids is that um, within the plant, that's what they do for us, but why do plants have, have these flavonoid compounds in them? Well, the, the flavonoids in the plants are activated by, en oh, activated by environmental stresses within the plant. So if the plant has some kind of uh, nutrient deficiency, if it's attacked by bugs, if it, if it's, if it uh, has some kind of damage inflicted on it, this is its defense mechanism. This is what it uses internally as a defense mechanism, okay? To fight, fight off uh, infection and to fight, fight off bugs and stuff, all right? So this produced naturally under those conditions. And also, a lot of times, these flavonoids are primary pigments responsible for attracting pollinators and stuff. So they're, the, they're what's responsible for producing the deep color in fruits and flowers and whatnot. So here, this is an interesting thing. To me, I found this to be fascinating because these plants produce these compounds. Um, they produce them as, uh, under stress as uh, self-defense mechanisms. And then they also kind of serve the same purpose in us. When we eat the plants, we take those same compounds and, and our body uses them under the same, kind of for the same kind of purposes. Um, and plants and humans, as they kind of evolve together, kind of this is like a, a relationship between plants and humans that I don't think a lot of people realize. The problem is that um, um, it's commonly known that um, plants that are grown for food in agricultural systems and fertilized to the extent that they need to be productive um, what they typically do, it's like they say, all right, no stress. I don't have to produce as much as many flavonoids. I can, I can um, devote all my resources to producing um, the grain and the biomass and the other parts of the plant uh, is much more productive, but they don't have to produce the flavonoids, so they don't. All right? Question? Uh oh. You said that these are primary pigments. Are you, would that be chlorophyll, which is a pigment? I know chlorophyll is a pigment, dependent upon nitrogen. Though the more nitrogen you have, the greener your leaves are because nitrogen is actually in chlorophyll. I don't think this is chlorophyll. This is other. This is. Uh, I don't think. Chlorophyll. Well, the three that she tests for, and I've got them named up here in a couple more slides, none of those are chlorophyll. So she did not test for chlorophyll. You, uh, your, your question, you're still wondering about something. I'll, I'll wait for your additional slides. Okay. So, the, so Organic and conventional systems, of course, differ, differ in many ways, and one of those ways is typically organic systems have less nitrogen available to them because you're using different forms of nitrogen. Farmers can't just pour it on. Okay, conventional systems typically over-fertilize for nitrogen to make sure there's plenty there. It's the most limiting plant nutrient there is. And so they put on as much as they can to guarantee that that won't be the limiting factor. Okay. Organic systems, on the other hand, have to use those more natural forms of nitrogen that aren't as available, so the plant is, has, le has less of it available. And, and so the plant responds to that. As I said, it's almost like it says, uh, if it's in a conventional system, hey, I don't have to worry. I'm, there's no stress. I don't have to worry. And if you think about it, the farmer takes care of the weeds. He sprays and kills the bugs. You know, I'm kind of humanizing plants here, but in a sense, he said, the plant says, great, I don't have to worry about these other things. I don't have to produce the natural self-defense mechanisms that I normally do. I can just devote all my, all my resources to growing, growing grain, and that's why conventional ag is so uh, high-yielding. 
So then they did, they compared. I hope you can see this, okay. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide first to show you the numbers. The flavonoids she looked at were something called quercetin, naringinin, and camphorol. I'm not a nu nutrition scientist, so I don't, I'm not familiar with these things. But those are the three flavonoids they kind of focused in on. If you can see here, the, there were clear, very significant differences uh, between a conventional and organic. Conventional had 64 milligrams per gram of um, dry matter quercetin. Uh, organic had almost twice the level. And if you go back to this uh, graph, you can see you have to look closely because the scale here is, diff is different than the scale on this side. This is the conventional system. These are the levels of these um, flavonoids along here. But the, the, the scale here is uh, almost double. The top one is 180. So all these levels are higher, except for the, um, the middle one, nar naringanin which I don't know what that is, but it was just a little bit higher. It was 39.6 versus 30.2. So this was kind of the first paper to come out and say, yes, organic does have higher levels of some nutrients. And it, and it gave a good reason why, a logical reason why that's probably so. Now, there's the other obvious reason why organic food is probably healthier for people. And I think this is why people buy organic food is because there's fewer pest, there's less pesticide residue on it, which I don't know of anybody who wants to eat more pesticides in their in their diet, because we typically just believe that's not that can't be good for us to eat that stuff. So um, so this was a kind of and there's been other studies now as well just recently come out to sh that that have supported this this research. The next question is is organic productive enough um, because typically organic yields are lower, especially early in the process when a farmer first transitions to organic, he sees his yields go down. The, the, the typical reason for that is weed pressure. That's the strongest challenge for an organic farmer is to control weeds. He doesn't have the tools available to him that the conventional farmer has and so he has to relearn how to control weeds. But I've, I've talked to countless organic farmers who have transitioned and described something that happens actually in the field when they transition. It's like they've taken their field off of steroids or something, and the field has to, has to come to some kind of new equilibrium ecologically. And um, it takes typically three to five years, but after that time, the farmer, the, the weeds are under control again, um, mainly because the farmer has learned the system and figured it out, how to do it without, without the, pet, the uh, herbicides. But also something actually happens in the soil. Um, but are they really that much lower? Are organic yields that much lower? So here's some research. Um, actually, this guy wrote a paper, Bill Liebhart, wrote a paper and put it in this bulletin where he reviewed a bunch of research over the years. This was published in 2001. Um, seven major universities. Also, he looked at work from Rodale Institute and um, some other, another institute and compared and did a comparison. Here's what he found. Corn, 69 total cropping seasons compared. Organic yields were 94% of conventionally produced corn. Organic yields were 6% less than comparable uh, uh, conventional fields. Soybeans, the number was 94% as well. Wheat, 97%. Organic crops produce 97% of the yield that conventional crops produce. Well, how do you define a cropping season? I don't want to get 69 years of data. Uh, no, there's probably, there's probably, there's multiple, he, he pooled together multiple research projects. And each research project maybe had three, four, five seasons worth of data. And when he pooled them all together, he was actually comparing 69 different cropping seasons, probably from different regions and all over. Uh, tomatoes, 
14 years of comparative research on, on tomatoes, no yield differences. No yield differences at all. There's another um, uh, research project that I also included in this, organic versus conventional production systems in Wisconsin. This is a long-term cropping systems comparison study initiated at two locations in Wisconsin. They did the same thing. They compared across years and systems um, for over 10 years, I believe. It was corn, organic corn yielded 91% of what the conventional corn yielded. Soybeans was 92%. Forage dry matter, which uh, is like pasture or hay, um, actually the organic system yielded 10% more than conventional fields. Okay. Um, a couple things though, that I want to point out about this. First of all, they, they, in this same research project, they, they deem that some, there was something about crop rotations and manure that seemed to make the difference for organic systems. Every, every organic system that had crop rotations or manure did much, much better. There's something about, about manure that's better than just chemical-based fertilizer. And this was an interesting thing, too, because he, he teased out this um, data here. In about a third of the site years that they did the research, the weed pressure was so bad, mainly due to the weather. It was probably a year like this, where it was rainy, they couldn't get in, due to primary tillage, uh, weeds became a problem. Yields in the organic system, because they don't have the means to control weeds uh, chemically, drop down to 74% of conventional systems. But the other two-thirds of the year, they were able to control weeds mechanically, no problem. Yields for the organic were 99%, virtually the same as conventional yields. So here's my question. I mean, we've spent billions of dollars on research to get conventional yields where they are on our main crops. Billions of dollars on research. We spent a pittance, of, of, a fraction of that amount on organic research, mainly done by farmers just tinkering around in their, on their farms. And we're able to get 90 plus percent of the yield of conventional. What if we devoted some real research dollars to organic? I think we could figure out how to do it. So the next question then is, is organic environmentally friendly? Is it really organic, or is it really better for the earth? Um, I guess I found this paper. There's many, there's many things I could have talked about here. I mean, there was just a recent paper that came out that said organic farms are better for honeybees. They somehow are able to survive better on organic farms than, than conventional production systems, things like that. There's lots of research on. Uh, but energy use, this guy uh, measured the energy use in organic food systems and compared it to conventional. And here's some interesting facts that he came up with. The U.S. food system accounts for 19% of the national fossil fuel energy use. 19% of, of the energy that we use in the country is devoted to agricultural production. And that includes you know, processing, transporting all that food, uh, storing it, drying it, all the, all the stuff. There's a lot to it, not, not just farming, okay? Um, conventional ag uses more overall energy than organic systems due to the heavy reliance on energy-intensive fertilizers and chemicals and concentrated feed. Um, in other words, organic farming takes less energy to produce each unit of, it, of, of calories. And energy inputs are lower for organic to get, to get an equal amount of energy, energy outputs than conventional. And it's mainly because of all the energy we, we use to produce fertilizers and chemicals. Tremendous amount of energy to produce those, those things that, uh, that uh, go into our farming system. Okay, so just on a pure energy, on an energy basis. Um, even when you count lower yields for organic, 
it still doesn't make up for the fact. It's still more energy efficient. Organic is still more energy efficient, even with lower yields. Um, and so energy use uh, um, is a big issue now, of course, because of what we all commonly believe is, uh, is the um, uh, effect on global warming and greenhouse gases. All that energy being burned uh, is supposedly being released as a greenhouse gas. So if we could lower our energy use, would that improve the environment? If we could lower our energy use for agriculture, would that improve the environment? I say yes, it would. Not only that, Rodale has done some great work that they've just released showing how much better organic farming is for the soil. This one thing could have a huge impact globally. Organic farming actually improves soil quality, improves organic matter within the soil. Or improved organic matter is actually carbon being sequestered in the soil. So not only it could ag, uh, not be part of the problem anymore, it could actually be part of the solution to this by sequestering more of the carbon in the atmosphere, in the soil, where it is safely kept out of the atmosphere. Um, and the, and the, um, the capacity for that is, is what Rodale has documented and calculated is, is tremendous. It's just incredible how much land there is, and if we could increase the organic matter by one or two percent, how much carbon that could sequester and, and what kind of effect that could have. So, all right then, I'll an to answer my questions, to go back and answer my questions, I, I do think that organic food is healthier um, because it seems to promote the production of higher levels of these flavonoids and also uh, lower pesticide residue. Not in detail, but that's, uh, that is also an environmental uh, plus of organic, is that there isn't the runoff of farm chemicals that do end up in our streams and rivers. There's the whole issue of the dead zone down in the Gulf of Mexico, that agriculture here in the Midwest um, has a great impact on much of our nitrogen is not used by the plants it's intended to use. It runs through our drainage systems, through creeks and rivers, and ends up down in the dead zone. Everybody, does everybody, is everybody aware of what that is and why that is? Um, organic agriculture could, could play a big part in, in lowering the impact of that too. So yeah, I was not going to go into any more of that, uh, because of time, but, but it's there. I, I, I could have talked about many things. Is organic productive enough? I think it could be. I think it is, and I think it could be. Um, again, especially if we devoted some real research dollars to organic and growing organically, I think we could figure out ways, ways of doing it. Uh, and um, is it environmental, more environmentally friendly? Yes, organic matter increased, carbon sequestered, water quality improved. Biodiversity improved, energy conserved. There's just uh, numerous um, reasons why that is true. Now, I've painted a pretty rosy picture of organic agriculture and all the great things it can do to save the world, but it's, uh, it is a little more complicated because I think, I guess what I'm not proposing is that we go 100% organic agriculture. I, I'm, I'm not sure that we could do that. And I'll tell you why. It's because of this book right here by this guy named Smill who wrote this, wrote it's called Enriching the Earth. It's, it's, it's about nitrogen. It's about the nitrogen issue, uh, industry and how we started uh, manufacturing nitrogen back in World War I for, for bombs. And, and when the wars were over, we converted over to agricultural use and how much of the world is fed now on manufactured nitrogen. In fact, he estimates in this book, and I wish I had had more time to go in, into this in my talk, that 40% of the world, if we were to eliminate manufactured nitrogen right now, 
we could not feed 40% of the world. 40% of the world is fed with manufactured nitrogen. And so, um, a as I've already pointed out, organic sources of nitrogen, if you go strictly by the rules, they're limited to natural sources of nitrogen, manure, green manures. And he points out in this book that we would not be able to produce enough nitrogen to grow crops worldwide. Now, on a local scale, I believe if a farmer has an integrated system of livestock and, and, um, and crops, he can make a local, uh, he can make his farm sustainable organically. But on a global system, I'm wondering now if we can feed as many people as we have without the manufactured nitrogen that we need. But why not create some kind of hybrid system that has the benefits of organic, yet we use as much the nitrogen that we do need to feed the world to enhance, enhance yields. I don't know. I haven't thought this all the way through, but that's an issue that on a global scale probably needs a lot more thought. Yes? I, I'm going to read that book. I'm curious to know if uh, does the author uh, discuss, you know, how, how, do, how do we do it before World War I? How do we, how do we feed everyone before that time? Is it, do we have that many more people on the planet? We do. We do have a lot more people on the planet. The population was much less back then. It was under 3 billion. Be less than half what we have now. And so, it, yeah, it's a fascinating book, and it starts out talking about the, the inventors, Bosch and Haber, the Bosch-Haber um, system of producing nitrogen from uh, natural gas and, and whatnot. So, um, and then the consequences of it to our, to our society. And a huge part of the book is about agriculture and the effect on agriculture. Yes? I had a question uh, on the, uh, the labor part of it. I can could, I could understand the state like China being able to maybe do an organic system with their large number of, uh, of labor, labor population. Yeah. But uh, it seems to me like some of these uh, developed countries like I mean, the United States, Canada, and maybe European would have a greater difficulty handling the labor part mm -hmm. of the organic farm. Very much so. It's fine to do five acres or two acres, but when you get into the, the size acres in Illinois, I don't know where you'd have the labor to no, it, it's a real, that is a real serious issue because uh, there are farmers scaling back because they can't find the labor, especially for vegetable crops. In Illinois, actually, we can grow grains organically in a, rot in a longer term rotation. We can use all the same large scale equipment for tillage to control weeds and, and whatnot. We can grow cover crops. We can ha have uh, animals in there in the rotation that contribute to the fertility. We can, we can do that. It's the vegetables. And the fruit, grown on a large scale, are, are very labor labor intensive out in California. It's, it's a real issue. Yeah, it, it is. Yes, John. I heard a talk last month in Champaign where some of your presentation, he cited a paper that was done recently where they tested the blood of people eating conventional food, mm. then switched them for a specified time mm. to organic. Mm -hmm then switched them back to conventional and then back to organic and they tested the blood for pesticides and the, the graphs were just very dramatic. Mm. I don't know if you're aware of that. I'm not, I wasn't. I'll try and find the reference. Yeah, that'd be great. And when you were talking about nitrogen, has anyone calculated how much carbon is stored in the soil pre-settlement? Mm versus today when the farmers seem to be mining the organic matter out of the soil? I'm sure they have, but I, I don't know what those numbers are. It's, it's, it's a tremendous amount. Because uh, what has happened, these soils were loaded with carbon when we first started farming them, but as soon as we broke them open and injected oxygen, it just is it, like a slow burn. It just burned up that carbon. The microorganisms within the soil use it for food. And, and emit it. Carbon is never destroyed or created. It just changes forms. And so a lot of that carbon just moved from the soil into the atmosphere through our farming system. But organic matter is so incredible because it helps with water holding capacity. It has nutrients, that slow release of nutrients. 
I mean, there's just so many pluses to increasing organic matter that they're too numerous to name. Uh, yes? What are, the, what are the regulations on organic farming with regards to creating hybrids? Um, like, what are the limitations of, of hybrid technology or there, there aren't any if you use, just use traditional breeding methods. The problem is with GMOs, you, you know, these um, geneticists are grabbing DNA from animals and injecting them into, into plants and, and creating, creating proteins and, um, and species that would never, never exist in nature, never be able to exist in nature in our time, of course. But, and so that's, uh, there's a feeling that there might be some unintended consequences that we're not aware of yet. And so they, at this time, organic, I was just talking to a corn breeder the other day, and he said, oh, right, organic's good, and, but why don't they allow GMOs? I just I don't understand it. It's just another form of plant breeding. He, he just didn't get it. He didn't get what, what the problem was, and, and a lot of people don't, but they definitely drew the line there and can't use that. But otherwise, traditional forms of breeding, uh, there's no limitation. You're not limited to high... Uh, Heirloom varieties or older varieties. A lot of farmers grow those because there's a market for them, but you're not limited to those. I wanted, I wanted to, to complicate it just a little more, my statements about nitrogen and whether we could sustain this. On goal, by, by just teasing you with this, do, does any, do you guys know what's going on in Cuba? Have you heard what's going on in Cuba? In Cuba, in the, in the early 90s, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed and, and the U.S. stepped up its, its blockade of, of imports and, and Cuba was virtually left overnight with no fertilizer and no means to get manufactured fertilizer. It all came from the Soviet Union for them. They had to reconfigure their entire agricultural system and they have done so. And, and virtually gone back to an or, uh, what is primarily an organic system. They have a small amount of fertilizer, but it's, it's, very, it's just a fraction of what they had. And they've done it using these methods. They, they immediately, almost immediately, reduced the size of their farms. They turned the land back over to just regular farmers who still remembered old ways. And they, early on there were food uh, shortages but over the years, they have, they have uh, become self-sufficient using, using sustainable and organic methods of farming. They have become self-sufficient in, in food again. They turn all their vacant lots into cities. They've turned all their vacant lots into gardens. And um, they're growing using manure and green manures and, and other technologies. I haven't, this is another book I haven't read all the way through. But it's a, fa it's a fascinating story. It's like a case study of what would happen. What, what could happen if, if we didn't have manufactured fertilizers anymore? They, they've, they've managed to somehow do it. Um, and so I wanted to share that with you. And if you want to learn more, this book is called Sustainable Agriculture and Resistance, Transforming Food Production in Cuba. came out just a, a couple of years ago. It's got multiple authors, but it's a fascinating story. So they're managing to do it. <laughs>